Okay, recording is happening. Great. Okay, well, let's begin then. Irina, um, let's open up your presentation. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Just let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which one? Ah, uh, probably is the one? top one first, yeah. It's a bit longer, probably than the 10 minutes. So. That's okay. We have 30 minutes for both of you, and we're not quite there with a few minutes off. So, yeah. all good. I'll just start present here. I'll just share this. There you go. Uh, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Good. So uh, this presentation, as I said already, is about location integration project or location index, and um, the number of government organizations like. ABS, uh, Department of Environment and Energy, Agriculture, Science Australia, and CSIRO, which are doing it. This project is also part of a uh, big, deeper project, which uh, that integration partnership for Australia. So it's uh, quite a big project. Uh, it's two years in duration, and we are now halfway through the second year. So to start with, it's just, oops. Can we get to the video? Just trying to get to the video. Yeah, I've got mouse. It's always causing me issues. Can we get the sound? Yeah, we do have it somewhere. That makes information about location one of the key ways to link the data together. The problem has been that it's been aging. Cause location one. So, map coordinates. Others. Irina, we're not actually hearing the audio, so it's not really oh. well. Can we? Oh. Okay, hold on. I'll try to pause it. Can we move it up? I don't know whether we could just turn up the volume so the mic does pick it up. So let's try now and let me know if you can hear it because for me it's yeah. Can you hear now? No, we're not really getting the audio coming through. Mm -hmm. No? No, okay. it's not coming through. Okay, no, okay. So we skip then the video itself. That's okay. And um 
it will be included into the presentations or the link so people can look at it later okay that's Thank you. yep no that's okay yeah so basically the purpose of the location index is to integrate uh, different types of geography and try to bring together spatial and non-spatial data and connect data on society economy and environmental layers and what we're trying to do is to create a system which uh, will support decision uh, based on fit for purpose data with uh, known authoritative source and using best technology and available on demand from the device of choice because the whole infrastructure is available on the web so our challenge is how to join multiple geographies and observations together they are not structured in the same way and we're probably all familiar with those so we have our raster data we have our vector data and these are just examples of uh, different data types and we have a lot of different tabular uh, data as well and sometimes it has no coordinates itself so geography is represented by description canberra new south wales it could be area it could be represented in uh, as latitude longitude or it could be collected aggregated this way so the question is how to bring them together and that's what we are trying to do so we have a number of challenges so challenge number one is data integration and what we want to do is to have the data to be accessible and also follow fair principles not just delivered and downloaded so people can access it in city and integrate with their own data set on the web so we want it to be findable so it needs to be registered or indexed in a searchable source and each of the data objects uh, needs to be uniquely identified and assigned with business identifiers it also needs to be self-describable from metadata it needs to be accessible so it needs to follow standardized protocols which are all both free and universally used we also need to be aware of authentication and authorization procedures. The data needs to be interoperable, so it needs to follow some agreed format, open preferably, and use the same language and agreed set of vocabularies. And also reusable. So it needs to be uh, machine readable and also with no license security constraints and provenance and follow agreed community standards. And this is the link to the FAI principles for people who want to learn more. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to um, achieve as our goal, semantic integration of linked data, data available on semantic web. So what is the power of the linked data? So we can discover it through the web. It's enabled machine to machine communication. So any data integration or suitability can be achieved quite quickly and at a quite large scale. It's uh, also extendable system by uh, the default using uh, semantic web capabilities. And because of that, we can extend usage of this data beyond our traditional client base and use cases. And also it uh, enables the consistent data mining of, of multiple spatial and non-spatial uh, data through GIS, uh, without GIS software for open link data. The other challenge for us is innovative technologies. And the technologies we selected to use is linked data and also discrete global grid system technologies. So because it's actually unique uh, to globally unique project, no one tried to integrate data at that scale between multiple agencies. So there were lots of testing of the capabilities themselves. We need to build those capabilities based on our testing implement new tools for semantic integration of data we also try to reuse our existing tools and infrastructures where possible for example research vocabulary australia uh, <laughs> was selected us as a central um, place where we can all share our vocabularies the system is implemented in the cloud and also private repositories so how to communicate between those it's um, a big question 
And uh, secure access and integration is a huge uh, requirement, particularly from uh, ABS and information about personal um, circumstances. So we really need to be careful. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to build that extendable system, which is ready for reuse by other people. So the system, which is highly scalable, it is secure, and uh, we use uh, cloud tools available to us. The system is flexible, so it can be deployed by different users and custodians with the same repeatable code. We use GitHub code management system and use infra infrastructure as a code um, approach for this. And also easy to administer system. So the code deployed as a workflow through the Bitbucket pipelines. Basically the whole system can be picked up and uh, deployed by our users. So I just wanted to say a couple of words about the DGS technology because it's not necessarily well uh, known to people. So this technology allow us to integrate uh, data and in spite of its projection and data formats. And the technology is math based rather than uh, GIS based. So what it does, it's, uh, it creates an indexing system of equal, equal area tessellations around the globe. And therefore, every set at larger scale can be divided multiple times. So it's quite easy to apply mathematical algorithms and statistical algorithms rather than uh, <laughs> traditional GIS queries. And I'll talk about it a bit later as, uh, in an example. So our challenge number three is social architecture. So what are we are trying to do? We're trying to improve user experience and efficiency human-related processes, and also institutional culture. Social architecture is quite a big issue um, because every organization is doing things in a different way. There is no centralized uh, method for coordinating activities between multiple parties. So what we're trying to achieve is to build a system which is uh, user-centric and also to improve overall governance for data. So we need to be aware of security, privacy, and understand the ethics and other constraining, potentially constraining factors. We would like to improve data integration workflows uh, between our partner organizations. We would like to build a system which uh, help us to ensure data currency rather than downloads, and then we don't know uh, whether it's new data or not. We would like to enable multiple and quite complex user requirement and use cases. And yes, as I said, a support user-centric approach. And basically what we're trying to build here, going through this spaghetti um, way of managing data when everyone is downloading everyone's data and we don't know how it's used, to a more streamlined approach where you basically bring data to location index and index it and capture relationships. And then multiple analysts uh, can access the same index and then apply it to different methods of usage. So how are we bring it all together? So at the moment, we're building a set of ontologies. There are uh, one centralized ontology for the allocation index itself and individual ontologies for each of the data sets. We also build in individual registries and landing pages. So people can uh, look at uh, how their particular objects look like and uh, see minimum metadata about it, but it's also the system which allow multiple alternate views which are um, suitable for machine readability of the data. We are pre-calculating indexes of linked data sets. So we know what object is connected to the other object and in what way. And then that allows us to uh, query across multiple data sets. And this example allows us to bring together information for place names, from digital uh, elevation model, and from the DGS index as well. So this is an example of um, how we plan.
for Digital Earth Australia, it's um, a quite large compilation of satellite imagery and also some pre-built um, products. However, the satellite imagery just give you a range of values and it needs to be calibrated and assigned with uh, different attributes which are suitable for machine or human understanding and further mining and uh, analysis. And it was previously very difficult for them to bring together attribution, like in this example, surface water attribution, and information from the satellite imagery. It would take months and months and was impossible in some cases for the national uh, scale. So we were able to bring together the observations uh, or measurements from the surface water data set together with DA. And it took days, not months. It literally took a couple of days to bring it together. It also allows us to integrate raster and vector data. And we did need to create complex schemas and um, download them into the GIS. It was done very quickly as well. But because it's a repeatable process, it allows us um, consistent, uh, to bring consistent answers for a range of questions. Uh, it's repeatable and it allows us very easily to connect big data with little data. And in this particular case, it's been done through a common DGS index, these two columns here. Okay, so basically what we did, we, um, we assigned DJ, DGS attributes to satellite imagery cells and also to objects from the surface water and were able to connect them together. This is another example where we use the same methodology. So it's matching again digital with Australia satellite data and land parcel. So in this case, we are connecting the and cadastro information. And the question was, uh, which land parcel are in which irrigated area? So it was again quite quick um, exercise for us. So now uh, DA teams are quite interested in continue this collaboration. And at the moment we are calculating um, the whole Australia sort of integration of this data. These examples were done just preliminary just to test the capability itself. So as I said, Location Index is a two-year project. Mm -hmm. So the first year, it was mostly about learning capabilities and uh, technologies. So we created and tested new infrastructure, we created link data index and build capability for both link data and DGGS, implemented a number of APIs. And this year we were trying to um, progress operationalization for link data infrastructures, um, which is quite challenging. So we already released the governance framework and the social architecture document. We are continue, we continue developing APIs and our tools at the moment and building a demonstrator at the moment. We are also developing user guides, uh, special enablement of uh, data using both semantic web and DGS capability. So it's going to be available shortly. And we are extending uh, link data index and it just to us. So the initial set of data, which we were testing, included statistical boundaries, GNF or addressing data set. We also looked at the place names and geofabric but we're extending and beyond now and testing our surface water data for uh, that purpose. And so far it's proven to be quite successful. So what are the benefits? So we um, are unlocking data potential. So we're enabling machine-to-machine -machine data integration, analysis and mining. And we're also removing needs for cross-agency data transfer. At the moment, a lot of time is 
uh, taken by this. So it's huge improvement in efficiency and also getting uh, more current information to con consumers quickly. We also accelerated innovation. So all the developed protocols, tools, APIs, etc., they will be available not just to the partners but to all interested parties and their data assets uh, will be available through Internet of Things. So people who we don't know of may basically access our data very easily through the endpoints and services. So we're trying to bring uh, data to seamless data integration across multiple data sets and systems without putting them across and also maximize collaboration. So one of the uh, big achievements from last year was, and all partners indicated this, was collaboration. So improving relationships across multiple sectors, understanding each other, understanding each other's capabilities, building uh, new common use cases. And governance and workflows, common workflows and governance are quite important aspects of this as well. So that is the first presentation. <laughs> Any questions so far or we'll move to the other one? I've got a quick question, Irina. Um, for people who want to use this system, is there any training available? Not yet. But it's on the roadmap? Um, it probably will be next financial year. Mm -hmm. I suppose the moment we're still trying to develop new tools and everything, the procedures, guidelines, etc. So guidelines will be available as soon as they're released. Mm -hmm. um, so that could be used as a part of training, but we would like to test those on our partner organizations first. So yeah. Is that Any other questions from anyone? Um, just, just uh, Jonathan here. Um, Sarah's um, doing some of the development work on the linked data aspects. Um, if there's any interest in previewing some of those functionality and providing feedback, we'd be interested in engaging with um, anyone who would like to do that. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. And is there anybody else internationally who's doing anything similar? No. 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 Fantastic. <laughs> it's actually. Yeah. Hi, Yes. Hi, it's Robin Tottenham from Department of Agriculture. I mean, I just wanted to um, ask if you can elaborate a little bit more on, there was a point there where you said uh, that there wasn't a need for cross-agency data transfer. So I was just wondering what, how does that actually work? Okay, so what you do is you build this common index, which allow you to record relationship between data in one agency and data in a different agency. And through APIs and data services, only this subset of data is getting connected and, uh, and returned. So the data is open. Um, at the agency yeah, in the yeah. first instance. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's number of uh, prerequisites for the data. So each of each record or object from the data set needs to be uh, assigned with unique identifier. The data set needs to be uh, open and to be available on the web. So it could be some authentication and authorization processes applied as well. So it depends on the data and the system. And then basically this index is um, used as a sort of orchestration mechanism for bringing data together. Okay, thanks, Irina. I also just had another quick question. Do you think Loki will actually um, change the way we collect information in the long term? So part of this is about the ability to integrate different data types uh, and and I'm just wondering, is this a, um, an infrastructure to support a whole different way that we collect different types of information? Or do you think this will actually change the way we collect information? I think it 
um, change the way we use information. That's for sure. Um, it's also how we manage information. Probably not necessarily collection side of it. So for collection, probably my second presentation would be more, <laughs> more suitable. Um, but definitely how we use it. Make it more fair. Yeah. But I think it will actually change some of that collection because you won't have to be as constrained from the start of going, well, must have, we must collect this data in these units. Uh, you actually might collect it at one area and you'll be able to transfer it across. Yeah. And so we get to watch this space. Yeah. Thank you. We can ask Jonathan. Jonathan, do you want to add anything to this? Um, no, I think it was a good overview of um, the Loki project. Um, we're starting to push um, some products out um, in the next few months. So um, I expect that more will be available for people to hit and, and interact with um, in the near term. Mm. Yeah, so Department of Agriculture is involved uh, with location index and yeah we're working with them and Jonathan, Jonathan's group in particular on a particular use case. Hi and it's Kiran here. Uh, you mentioned uh, that one of the key challenges there was your social architectures. Um, you just elaborate a little bit more on that. Okay, so the social architecture, and as I said, it's a number of areas we're trying to look at. And one of particular, well, I, I would say several focuses, but this uh, central governance is a big question, discussion question for us. So how we can govern this data, con considering it's a common architecture and there are many partners and many parts coming from um, different organizations, we need to ensure that all these connection parts are working together. So we have common understanding how we update data, how we bring data together, how it's getting, how it's, uh, getting access, et cetera. So there are multiple um, questions for the governance group. And it needs to be a group between multiple partners. So at the moment, we basically have a big gap in this uh, space. So this discussion is just starting. So we need to probably talk to multiple partners, uh, starting from uh, Australian National Data Commissioner and with between all the partners, but basically it's a bit of a question mark at the moment. Um, the other bits and pieces of social architecture. So when we had a review of the project, most partners said that um, location index helped them to improve quality of their data because there are certain requirements for data connection, how we present data on the web. The quality of the data was assessed and improved. So it's bringing to changes in uh, the organizational culture itself about how they think about data, how they manage the data itself. Yeah, so those things. And I think something that will be part of that conversation is when data is aggregated, how do you then cite mm. the derived product? Yeah, so it's, it's multiple questions and we barely touched on this, but everyone is aware that it's an extremely important factor, equal to data itself and technology. So it's, Thanks. The second one. Okay. Presentation number two. So at the moment, I am the chair of ANSIC or ICSM metadata group. And where am I? I don't know. Okay, so metadata itself, it has multiple eight, uh, challenges. So what we face at the moment is a change in technology. 
and we all know about cloud computing and hybrid clouds. We know that there are certain requirements for machine readability of the data through advances of uh, things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. There are different expectations from people. We um, actually, in, a, in Just Science Australia, get introductions from uh, questions from people, individual questions. They want to find useful for them information online very quickly without calling or connecting someone and make decision about whether they want or not to use this information. Their standards themselves, this environment of standards is very complex. So we have ISO, we have OGC, we have W3C, we have community-based standards. So to understand their connections and the standards themselves, requires a lot of skills and we don't really have a lot of people who are skilled in this area and sometimes um, resources are not available within organizations to actually maintain those skills and we also have our common things like budget time and rules and in many cases metadata can help with resolving some of those so what is the metadata for organization business and the users so what we want to see is a content-reached fair metadata, and then it can be used as a promotion and communication tool within organizations, but also as risk mitigation and resource management tool. So it helps to promote your organization because users uh, can easier discover the outputs. It can improve efficiency. So as I said, it could be a metadata supporting self client self-service so they will understand what they're dealing with and make their own choice about it without actually taking resources from the organization itself it's reducing cost because you can find information and then which is leading to its use and to use and share it's improving machine to machine discoverability and integration and it's also minimizing uh, the business risk and liability when you have information about things like legal or security constraints or lineage you're basically protecting yourself declaring what people can or cannot do with the information up front and uh, it's reducing cost through improved resource management overall so what is a metadata working group and who we are so the meta, the Enslico was um, sorry the Enslico endorsed um, establishment of this group and the ICSM is actually established in November 2017. The first meeting was held in June 2018, so we basically a month uh, a year and a bit into uh, progressing. And the idea was that we will co uh, coordinate implementation of global metadata standards across Australia and New Zealand. So at the moment, uh, it consists of government agencies at federal and jurisdictional levels, research and academia organizations. The initial um, number of organizations involved were 15, now it's grew to 37. And at the moment, we have about 100 people on the mailing list. We also uh, run the Technical Metadata Working uh, Group, which is subcommittee of the Metadata Working Group. And currently, we have fortnightly meetings. And it's quite enthusiastic and persistent group of people who are progressing a lot of different outcomes. So it was established as a forum for communication and engagement with special communities and interest groups. And we have represent Australian representatives at ISO, OGC, and uh, W3C as uh, members, which help us to uh, integrate our development with those groups or uh, get feedback from them. We advise on best practices for metadata and associated tools. And develop a published metadata best uh, 
practices, relevant vocabularies, crosswalks, uh, communications materials, etc. So this is a website where you can um, access information about the metadata working group. It also has information related to previous meetings and uh, presentations which were done during these meetings, but also <laughs> the outputs of the group and in group uh, documents. So you can contact me if you would like to join the group. And I just put several examples from our projects. So we developed a roadmap which helps us to align our activities with um, overall um, decisions from the working group. We are developing crosswalks between different organizational catalogs and different metadata standards. So at the moment, we have about five organizations um, with cr cross uh, walk between their catalog uh, entries and this organizations using ISO 1.5-1. We also have uh, mappings to uh, RFCS, which is ARDC uh, standard, and also to DCAT and CCAT. And that's basically the example of what we're trying to do. We also developed the best practices user guide. So at the last meeting, which we held in at the end of October, we endorsed the user guide. So it's going to be available on the website shortly. And at the moment, we are working on a number of our user guides and investigating requirement for things like metadata for imagery and metadata for digital um, data preservation. But the current focus is metadata for services, how to describe service, what, is important, what are the important elements. Vocabularies. Uh, what we're trying to do is also is to publish vocabularies and we use in Research Vocabulary Australia for that purpose. And then those vocabularies are available in multiple, uh, multiple formats from XML to RDF. So they can be used by um, multiple use cases and uh, mechanisms. But also the usefulness of those vocabularies, we're always looking for some vocabularies. How to classify this, uh, like roads, for example, or how to classify the water streams. So this will give people at least centralized access to those vocabularies and they're open for usage. It could help with collaboration in terms of bringing maybe common vocabulary system and um, yeah, maybe form basis for some private vocabularies if needed. And also provide um, advice on metadata for different types of compliance. For example, digital continuity 2020 or GDA 2020 as well. So we're trying to explain to people what elements uh, of metadata should be used to be compliant with um, those regulations. Um, Irina? Yes. Yeah? Oh, sorry, just wondering uh, how much left in, in the presentation. Because that's it, that's it. That's the last slide, okay. the next one's questions. So it's very timely. <laughs> Thanks so much, Irina. That's all brilliant. So um, everyone be in touch with Irina and then we can distribute um, questions and have some answers along the way. Graham, I will roll over to you looking at the time. That's okay. Yeah. I've only got seven <laughs> sides. Okay, so yes, I can get that right. Okay. Sorry. I just need a state, thanks. <laughs> Melanie, while, while we're getting the presentation up running, uh, we might actually defer item number four next time or take it um, offline, just so that we don't run over time. Okay, um, this will be a little bit shorter. So, <laughs> um, so we've called it Elvis has left the building because it's actually went to the cloud. Um, and we're here today rather than being at GA because our whole infrastructure has gone down. Uh, so that's a good, mm -hmm. good example of why we don't 
build things in house anymore. <laughs> we actually go to the cloud. So probably three, three and a half years ago, uh, we used to have a system um, for elevation data called Netif Portal. Uh, it was terrible. It had buttons that never actually did anything. Um, it was written on a server, uh, Microsoft server, and every time Microsoft updated it, it would cost us $15,000 to get someone to change the code. Uh, so uh, just before Christmas, uh, three and a bit years ago, we said, it finally fell over and we said, no, we're not fixing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so Shane and Crossman and myself were in a meeting and we just said, look, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna reinvent the wheel um, and see if we can do this better. So we actually had to set, how do we wanna do that better? One, we actually wanted it to work, which at the time was actually quite critical because we had something that didn't work. Um, it had to be technology agnostic. So we didn't wanna be stuck uh, like in a uh, Microsoft server anymore. We wanted it to actually be out. So we went to the cloud. The cloud for us is that yes, it works in AWS, but if tomorrow AWS put up their costs, we could pick it up and we could move it to Azure or any other cloud provider. Uh, we didn't want to be tied into uh, an infrastructure or a software solution to a problem. Uh, we had to, it was big data, so we're talking terabytes of data. It had to be fast and it had to deliver it really quick, and it had to do it over the web. Um, I had two staff at that point in time just handling queries and putting stuff on a hard drive. Uh, we couldn't do that anymore. And it would have been really nice if it stopped the complaints that we were getting, because we we're getting a lot. Um, so that was one of our main focuses. And it had to ship and clip. We didn't want to do what we'd currently done, which was give someone a terabyte worth of data if they only wanted two gigs worth of actual data from that data set. And probably the biggest change that we did is we actually had to make it simple for the user. Um, my experience of working in government is we love making things uh, simpler for ourselves. So we have to do less work, uh, but we tried to not do that. It was about how do we actually get data to the user? It may mean more work for us, but we actually want to focus on that. It had to cost less. We had to keep a linkage to our users um, because in the past we'd actually made things CC by and available, but if you can't tell who's using it, it's hard to validate why you're actually doing it. And the last one was we gave ourselves a month and a half to do it uh, with Christmas in the middle. So we built this infrastructure, um, try and be quick. We really wanted to just go against sort of, along a business model. There's a shop, there's a warehouse, there's a factory, and you deliver it. Um, don't really care about the shop that much. A lot of people say, oh, not another portal. If they're worrying about a portal, that's the wrong thing to be worried about. Um, so my analogy is that you can buy your tin tams from Coles, you can buy them from Woolies. Do you really care which shop you got them from? Not really, you care which warehouse and which factory they came out of. So that was sort of, our goal is that if we have an area where we can keep the data, such as the warehouse, but it doesn't matter how many portals access it, because everyone's accessing the right data. Um, and so we use that, we use the factory, which is uh, FME to actually clip data and send it to the warehouse and deliver it to people. So we cut things down from about three days at its quickest, uh, to now you're looking at probably two to three minutes to get the same amount of data that you want. So currently, two and a half, three years later, uh, we're sitting at nearly 7,000 orders a month, but I haven't changed these stats. We've got over 40 terabytes of data sitting there, oh, 40 terabytes delivered each month. Uh, we've got 60 plus million dollars worth of data sitting on a server somewhere in AWS, uh, and it doesn't cost us a lot. It costs us about $70,000 a year for storage and delivery. Um, before, we actually had to pay $200,000 a year, basically, for the disk that was actually running it before. So it's gonna take a long time until we actually get to the cost that it was costing us in the old system. It didn't work. Uh, we've got a, a lot of discrete users because we can actually deliver everything through an email. Um, but also now, Represented, we've probably got 70 terabytes worth of data 
sitting in one location. So how should we use that? What should we do? And that's the question we're starting to use. But also we thought we knew who our users were, but we don't actually, when we've actually looked into it. So this is more getting into the, the users of Elvis. I will give you a demo quickly uh, of how to use it, but it's a, we've actually surveyed them about a year and a bit ago. Who's using it? Where, so I've got a lot of stats, but I've only got two uh, in this presentation. So people are using it weekly and monthly significantly. Uh, so it's part of how people work now. But this is probably the biggest change is we identified where those orders were coming from. And our biggest user are engineering. And that's significant because an engineer wants the data to make a design or a decision on, but they want the data that they made that day. So they want to download it. They don't want a service because it doesn't actually allow them to go to court and argue that this is the data they made the decision on. Uh, so we actually haven't had a great deal of people saying, oh, it would be great if we had a service of the elevation data, because that's not serving the need that they want. And then we've actually worked this into the order process where you actually put what industry do you think you come from? And so this is last month's. Uh, you can see engineers again. Uh, the fourth one, which is construction, is something that a year and a half ago, we hardly had any but now it's starting to actually take off in that construction industry. So we're getting some business analysts analytics about this uh, and how useful it is. So that's really quick uh, because I wanted to quickly... So this is the data we've got. It doesn't look like a lot, but there is data covering the whole of the country. Uh, New South Wales has been very specific about covering and making available all of this, so it's quite significant. Um, Victoria, not so much, uh, but hopefully that's changing. Western Australia still runs in a model of charging for data, so they haven't got a lot of data on there, um, but we're, we're starting to build that pressure and that change of what it can mean of making data available is much more beneficial for your jurisdiction or your state to do that. So I'll quickly just give you an idea. So this go, is going off, checking what data is available for that area that I just selected. So I'll try and zoom in. And I purposely chose the border. So we've got some New South Wales planning and industry data. So this is actually uh, top over symmetry. So if I scroll over it, you can see where that coverage of that data is. Uh, New South Wales spatial services. They've got one metre and two metre products. You can see all the tiny little, they do it in two kilometre square grids. Point clouds, Geoscience Australia data. I must have missed the board up there. Digital Earth Australia. So it basically goes and it finds this what he's saying. So all the data that is in the system that is available and gives you the option of how you can actually access it. So if I choose just one, so it's quick. I'm actually interested in that one. I want to download it. Put your email in. Uh, you tell it you're not a robot because we're the only site that actually has been hit with a with an attack um, just by someone actually putting repeat tiny little orders. Uh, the good thing is didn't actually break it. Uh, it just slowed it down. So that's. Yeah, 
Anyway, <laughs> we'll do that. Put your email in, and it'll send it send you an email to download it off to, um, from Amazon. So. Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, um, probably best if we email you then, and people might be interested in more system architecture and use case diagrams so they can understand how it might uh, overlap with what they're doing or attempting to do, and also be interested to hear how, because this was pre lock I, so then yeah. how that might overlap, how did you have all of this across various providers, consistency, etc. So yeah, so well, just build it's, it's never been a technical problem. It's always been a relationship problem. So it's about how so going out and actually talking to the states uh, and territories about how they can be involved. Uh, we don't charge them to put the data there. That's their value proposition. Mm -hmm. um, and it's to the point where they would they are saving millions of dollars because they don't have to build an infrastructure themselves to, mm -hmm. to do it. Great. Well, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, it's over the time. Yes. So, so uh, now you just very, very quickly to reply about location index. So mm -hmm. if we have a presentation about place names, that's probably connection to location index as well. So that would be a good, uh, yeah. Great, let's do that. Super. Okay, um, apologies to people who um, didn't want to go over time. We are over time. Yes. Thanks so much to everyone for participation. We will um, defer outstanding items until our next meeting. Uh, would anyone like to say anything before we disappear? So, Melanie, the next meeting date? Uh, uh, nothing set in stone. So, yep. uh, I'll, let's have a little chat about that and come up with when that might be. And, um, yeah. That'd be good. Currently in the in the presentation list, we've got things down for the 21st, which is next week, probably a bit too soon. It was the FSDF and the 2026 agenda, um, but we'll have to confirm that by email. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's do that. And please, everyone, we'd really like to hear from you. And um, we have some documents in place for upcoming presentation ideas. ideas or resources that you'd like to see come out of this. So yeah, please be in touch. And I'm soon we'll all be in touch about uh, medication and online presence, etc. Thank you. Great, all thanks right. so much. Thank okay. you. Thanks. And please yeah, contact us if you've got any requests, information, requirements. <laughs> Bye. Great. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.